countries, uh, given uh, what we what the information that we have from the Gaia satellite. Uh, and as Flip mentioned, my full name is Kopalang, but uh, people call me Gopi. Uh, this work was uh, uh, work done with uh, Matt, Matthew Buckley at the uh, Rutgers and Chris uh, Murphy, who's now left uh, the field and works for Wayfair. So I don't know the the uh, uh, everyone's the, the level of uh, knowledge of everyone here, so I made this talk very very simple. So please uh, excuse me for that. Now, so the base question is, what is dark matter? Right? We know that the microphysics of dark matter uh, is one of the biggest mysteries in in nature today, if not the biggest mystery. Um, we don't know anything about it. All we know that it is, is that it exists. Well, the next question is, how do we know that dark matter exists? We have a lot of uh, uh, gravitational evidence. This includes um, the rotational velocities of uh, galaxies, which tell us that they must be halos around uh, galaxy, um, uh, galaxies like our own and our neighboring galaxies. Um, and this we, we, we have, this was inferred from uh, Newtonian mechanics, whereby we're looking at face on at the spin of the galaxy, we can see that we expect that galaxies, we expect galaxies to uh, rotate slower, but in, uh, towards the edges of the, uh, towards the edges of the galaxy. But in actual fact, they rotate uh, almost the same rate as close to the center. This tells us that they, this gives us information that there must be some unseen mass uh, around the galaxy, which we infer as some dark structure uh, halo. Now there's also the concept of gravitational lensing, which at the scale of higher than uh, galaxy galaxies, which is the clusters of galaxies. So when you see galaxy mergers, like for instance, the, the poster child for this is the, uh, what we call the bullet cluster. Um, we know that the bullet cluster was a merger of two uh, galaxies, uh, galaxy clusters, like we saw. But then what happened was that the visible matter uh, got uh, deterred uh, from that. And what was left was the uh, invisible uh, stuff, which is the what we call the dark matter. And we infer the invisible stuff uh, with this uh, through gravitational lensing, whereby stars or galaxies from behind the invisible blobs is lens, so it's bent, the light is bent around these um, uh, structures or halos of dark matter. And that's how we, we can tell that they're there. So this tells us that dark matter exists from uh, gravitationally uh, at the scales of galaxies and also at bigger scales of galaxy clusters. Now, the CMB spectrum is also another uh, big evidence. It's, some might say that it's actually the most important evidence that tells us that dark matter exists in our universe, because the CMB, the CMB spectrum allows us to zoom out of our, and, get, and see the whole universe as a picture. And this uh, power spectrum tells us a lot about our universe. For instance, the shape and where it's position, or sorry, this first peak and where it's position tells us the shape of our universe. This uh, third peak tells us uh, uh, that there is dark matter in our, in our universe. Now, how do we know that? Is that we have this data, we have two fits to the data. One fit is uh, the, this uh, model is uh, the dotted line is the uh, Lambda CDM, which is a dark matter, cold dark matter model. And the solid line is the modification of Newtonian dynamics. So we see clearly here that dark matter fits the, the data at this peak, the third peak, uh, much better than modification of Newtonian dynamics uh, does. So we know that there's dark matter at uh, gravitation that it interacts with us gravitationally at, at all scales. The next question is, well, what is it? The inconvenient truth about it is that we don't know what it is. As a particle physicist, I like to think of it as, you know, it points to a new particle. And evidence actually does show, like for instance, the bullet cluster does show that it actually it points to, to a some sort of new particle that we haven't, we don't know yet. What is that particle's mass? Does it have mass? It must, it must have it. Mass, some level of mass, right? Uh, what is its spin? We don't know. Does it decay? Nature also only tells us, Mother Nature only tells us that this thing interacts gravitationally. And if, if nature's kind, it will show us uh, some other interactions in the near future. However, if nature's unkind, this is all we're ever going to see of that matter. Is it a particle that is formed from other particles that are, that lie under some dark sector physics that we don't which we don't know yet, or is it uh, an elementary particle in that dark sector? I would argue that to have any hope of directly probing it, we must see these non gravitational interactions uh, uh, with us. 
And so we've seen this plot before. I think many of us maybe have seen this plot before that there's a vast range of what dark matter could be uh, from all the way from what we call fuzzy dark matter, uh, which are bosons, all the way to primordial black holes that were formed. These are black holes that are formed uh, when the universe was a baby. And so um, if, we see a, if we see a signal of dark matter in our, one of our experiments, it could be any one of these uh, things. So then it's up to us to go and find another way of actually finding the dark matter and figuring out what actually what it is. So right now, actually, we are in a, in a very good uh, situation whereby from we, we have many tools at our disposal from both particle physics and astrophysics. So the, 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 the field of uh, looking for primordial black holes has emerged uh, quite strongly. And using um, um, upcoming uh, telescopes like the, the uh, uh, Vera Rubin telescope and many other uh, future proposed telescopes, um, we have various ways of looking for dark matter. But traditionally, uh, up until like recent history, we, there were three pillars for, for that. They still are really, for in, if you look at it from the particle physics sense, the three pillars, I would say three and a half, of how we look for, for dark matter. One is to look in the sky. Uh, we can look at, at colliders. We just heard of uh, uh, Kuntal talking about uh, colliders like the LAC. Um, the other way is to look for also in deep underground uh, detectors. Now, semantics, colliders, and underground detectors are all underground, but okay, forget about that. Um, so, in the sky, we can look for dark matter detection, uh, dark matter annihilation to the SANA model. Um, in our colliders, we can look at for, for a SANA model annihilation into, into dark, producing dark matter, or we can look at the scattering of the two. Now, the half actually comes from um, the, the me mechanism with which, you, with which you produce the dark matter in the early years. So if, if you give me a model and you say, look, this is my model of dark matter, I don't care how you produce it. It has to match the, the relic abundance of dark matter that we see today. And this is the half. This is basically telling us that your dark matter is not your dark, really dark matter unless it matches that uh, relic abundance. So this is what you call, I, I call three and a half uh, methods of, of part in, from particle physics point of view of, the, of trying to find what dark matter is. So I'm just going to briefly go through this um, really quickly. So um, dark matter annihilates into the sun model in a place like the, the galactic center or both galaxies into either cosmic, like into final state cosmic rays, photons, or neutrinos. Um, we can have uh, radio signals, for instance, at the square kilometer array. You can look for gamma rays. And you can look for neutrinos uh, from dark matter annihilation. So that's something like the ice cube. And again, we have all these tools at our disposal that, that allow us to, to go and search for these, uh, these, these particles or the, the products of these uh, annihilations of these particles. So there's ice cube, there's upcoming Dune experiment. There's so many different uh, tools that we can, uh, we can use. Production in colliders, again, uh, gives us uh, some, some level of uh, control. Uh, because in a particle collider, for instance, you have a bunch of protons that you accelerate. Um, you start with another bunch of protons that you accelerate in the opposite direction. As these guys accelerate, uh, they, they meet in uh, a detector like the Atlas. We just heard about CMS. And, oh, my bad. Sorry. And they meet at this, uh, um, my simulation doesn't want to work. They meet at this uh, uh, um, detector and they produce some dark matter particles that we can search for or look for in our silicon detector. So we have so many different layers in this detector that we can uh, search for these particles. Now, let's consider the following uh, in terms of direct detection. Um, this is a, an artist's representation of our galaxy. We are about 8.5 kiloparsecs from the uh, center of the galaxy. So imagine that the, in our, a galaxy is like a, this galaxy is like a flat disk, but then in this around surrounding this flat disk is like a spherical halo, a spherical gas of dark matter particles. If we imagine, so we know that we are moving, the galaxy keeps rotating. We know that we're moving in a certain direction around the galaxy, uh, the galactic center. And so, in principle, if we think about the dark matter being stationary, uh, and we're moving through this gas of particles then it sees us moving towards it at 220 kilometers per second. 
we see it moving towards us at 220 kilometers per second. So in principle, you're getting hit by a wind of dark matter particles. Now, the easiest thing to do there is just to wait until the dark matter particle hits you. Right? Unfortunately, I, we don't have the, as humans, we don't have enough surface area. And even if a dark matter particle hits you, you wouldn't know what it, what it is. So the best thing to do is to build massive detectors and put them deep, deep underground. Right? And wait for a dark matter particle to come in, scatter, and uh, with the electronics that we, we know and we can control, we can kind of infer the properties of the stuff in the And so for this talk, I'm going to focus on uh, dark matter direct detection. So let's now go to the anomalies. Um, over the, the, the many few years, the, the past few years, there have been many anomalies in particle physics, uh, not least of which uh, have been for coming from dark matter uh, direct detection. Actually, we recently had one last year in June from the xenon one time experiment, and I'm sure uh, many of you will, will know that. One of the biggest controversies that we have comes from the Dharma uh, experiment. Um, many of you have, have any of you heard of Dharma? Well, I know at least few people in this group have heard of Dharma. Anyone else has heard of Dharma? Well, I don't, let's just assume that you have. I don't know, I don't know, I can't see anyone's reaction, so. Let's just assume that, uh, or let's assume you haven't. So now I will explain what Dharma is. So Dharma is, a, is an experiment, it's a detector uh, that is in the Grand Sasso Laboratory in Italy. It's made up of uh, uh, 100 kilograms of sodium iodine crystals. And it's located in this laboratory that has so many other different dark matter direct detection experiments, like the well-known xenon experiment. There's a neutrino experiment called Boroxino here. Um, there's Crest, another dark matter experiment, and many uh, different other uh, type of direct detection-like uh, experiments. Um, so this experiment measures um, an annual modulation of, of scattering events. Uh, this annual modulation is due to the fact that the sun moves around, um, the, the, the solar system is moving around the, the galactic center at a certain uh, uh, speed, and the fact that the Earth is moving around the sun uh, annually. So you see this uh, kind of sinusoidal uh, behavior of events. Their claim is that there is, um, they see a dark matter signal above any known cosmogenic background of corresponding to 12 sigma, uh, corresponding to 12 sigma. So they see a 12 sigma evidence of, of dark matter, 12 sigma, sigma signal of dark matter. Now, is 12 sigma a very a large event? Oh, sorry, a large number or not? I mean, feel free to unmute yourself and say yes or It's really big. It's huge. So, and if we know in particle physics, um, we see a three sigma event, we say, come on, three sigma is most likely a fluctuation, right? We see two sigma, we don't even, there's so many two sigma events at the LXC popping up everywhere, we don't even pay attention to them. We see five sigma, we get excited. We say, hey, like this is something that actually the, the Higgs was about uh, more than five sigma. So we say, this is, a new, this is a clear new signal and we have to pay attention to it. 12 sigma is like beyond our wildest dreams. Um, so we should we be celebrating that there is dark matter. Unfortunately, the, the, the biggest problem is that Dharma experiment has been saying this for the past 10, 20 years. Uh, at first they saw a 10 sigma signal and now with the phase two data, they see a 12 sigma uh, signal. So the question is, what is the, the, what are they seeing? The problem is the, all the other experiments see nothing. So our most uh, sensitive experiment right now is the xenon one time experiment. So this is the dark matter nucleus cross section uh, as a function of the width mass. So the, the, dark, the xenon one time is, uh, has placed its limit over here. All other experiments are about. So the xenon one, we, we should say that the xenon one ton uh, is in tension with all the other experiments, precisely because these other experiments use different materials. And I will, I will explain the material part uh, a little bit later. But surely, um, if that matter really had a cross section, or an interaction cross section of 10 to the minus 39 square centimeters with the Saturn model and a mass of roughly 10 GV, xenon one ton should have seen it, right? Uh, unfortunately, doesn't the xenon one ton doesn't see it, and all the other experiments uh, also don't see it. So what what what's going on? So the Dharma experiment uh, collaboration, they claim that they understand because they their backgrounds very well. So they claim that this is absolutely not a background issue. We don't know what it is, but it's it is not a background. We understand it very well. It could not be systematics. We understand things very well. 
Um, however, the, 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 the uh, experiment cannot be reproduced because the crystals are proprietary information and no one else can reproduce their crystals. Um, in fact, the recently, the recent thing that I heard was that they the company that produced their crystals actually went out of uh, uh, business. So we really cannot reproduce the, the experiment. So there are various things that, that could be causing this, this discrepancy. Some things that have been cited was the fact that uh, these experiments, the xenon one for instance, use a different material from sodium iodide. So it is in principle possible, and this was a uh, by theorist, that dark matter could prefer to interact with sodium iodide rather than xenon. And they call this xenon phobic, uh, or yeah, xenon phobic dark matter. Then they, there's also a question that has been raised about the dark, local dark matter uh, velocity distribution, that maybe this is not what we think it is. And this could be contributing to the, our lack of understanding of the dark matter, of the dharma signal. Uh, the matter. So let's explore this a little bit more. So the recall, nuclear recall rates, uh, rate at which dark matter interacts, or this, the, we, we get this at nuclear recall spectrum. This is dependent on the local dark matter uh, halo. Uh, density, the dark matter nucleus cross section, a form factor that uh, takes into account the fact that when you interact with the nucleus, you're not interacting actually with the entire nucleus, but you're interacting with the individual uh, uh, nucleons, like uh, protons and neutrons. Um, and this big chunk of information here, which encompasses the velocity distribution of the dark matter. Remember earlier I said, um, uh, I was talking about this uh, halo or spherical, um, the, the spherical uh, gas of particles. Now, if you think about it from a statistical physics point of view, we have kind of like what would we call an ensemble. This ensemble has particles that have different velocities moving in different uh, directions within that, that halo. And um, if, if, for instance, we said that we saw a dark matter particle, we actually cannot tell the velocity of the dark matter particle because they all of them are moving at different uh, velocities. So we, we would say that we are sampling from a distribution, uh, a dark matter distribution, uh, or a distribution of velocities, for instance. And so in order to, in, to take this into account, we have to integrate this whole distribution from the minimum velocity, and this minimum velocity is the, the velocity required for us, for dark matter to come in and, and cause a nuclear recoil to infinity. Infinity in this case is actually the escape velocity. So because if dark matter is, on, is in our galaxy um, moving at, at speeds faster than the escape velocity, then it's going to just going to gravitationally, it's not going to be gravitationally be bound in our galaxy. And so the question then is, what is this F of B? What is this velocity distribution? So many people talk about uh, for, for years, we think that the local velocity distribution is just the maximum Boltzmann distribution because we assume that the dark matter uh, is non-relativistic. And um, so this is, this is what we call the Simon Taylor model. This has been a subject of, of question for many years, actually, because um, anybody's simulation suggests that maybe this is not the best tracer for the local dark matter halo. And thus many people have, have proposed different uh, distributions. For instance, what if streams were the, the best uh, tracer for, for dark matter in our local uh, region? What if there was a flat disk? Now, the assumptions for this, again, is that dark matter cannot be a fermion here, and the, this, this is a, a different model. Other people have said, well, why should I care about the, this velocity distribution? Why don't I just assume that I found, let's just assume that we found dark matter, and we can actually infer what the velocity distribution is. So let's look at it in a model independent uh, way. This is where Gaia becomes uh, very important. So Gaia is a, uh, a space observatory uh, that is run by the, uh, the European Space Agency. It is uh, designed to look for stars, planets, um, and uh, other uh, objects um, in our solar, in, our, in the near our solar system. And by far, so far, it has, it has, they've constructed the largest uh, 3D catalog of, of all these uh, objects in our galaxy. So in, in this case, the, um, there was uh, studies have been done about uh, the idea that metal poor stars that are old uh, could, in our halo, could be used to trace uh, dark matter. And this was done by um, uh, this group. 
And given this, Gaia has seen all these uh, old, many of these old metal poor stars. And they, the, the, the information that from Gaia was used to infer about the, the local velocity distribution in our uh, local solar region. So here, as we can see, we can see the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution in, uh, in gray, the standard halo model. And this is the, the halo stars, and this is substructure. So a substructure here, I mean, the idea that the, the, our galaxy was actually formed from a hierarchical merger of uh, smaller galaxies, satellite galaxies, or, and later on tidal stripping uh, of these smaller satellite galaxies. So substructure here just means the, the stars coming from those uh, smaller galaxies that have been tidally stripped or forming uh, these, these mergers. So using this um, uh, idea, able to, to um, get a different velocity distribution from the standard halo model. Now, you may argue that come on, it's not that different, it really isn't that much different, but it actually is in a sense of, uh, uh, we look at the speeds that we're moving in here. This is actually the peak of here, of this distribution is actually quite different uh, to, to, to this guy. So they have also found um, recently, uh, as recently as 2018, they also found many high velocity streams um, of stars that are moving near our solar system. So this is the center of the galaxy and the star here is, the, is our solar system. So we see these clumps of streams that are moving in a certain direction with respect to our to the solar system. And they label them S1, S3, and S4. So for the purposes of this talk and for our study, we focus mostly on uh, the S1 stream. So if we assume that S1 still has its dark matter halo around it, so if we assume that S1 comes from, say, a, 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 a tidal stripping of a dwarf galaxy, I don't know, millions of years ago, and it still has a stark matter halo around it, then in principle, we could be in a different velocity uh, distribution of, we could have dark matter with a different velocity distribution than what uh, we expected from the standard halo model. And in principle, since this S1 stream is actually moving in counter rotation, so it's moving, so, so if the solar system is moving this direction, the solar system, this S1 stream is moving in the opposite direction. This could actually increase the, uh, the, the, the amplitude of this annual modulation uh, signal that we expect uh, from DAM. And so it's also a high velocity stream. So we expect a different distribution from the stream than what we expect from the standard halo model. And this is what we see from uh, our derived distributions. So this is the derived distribution from this, uh, the, the substructure that I just uh, explained. This is from substructure plus halo um, uh, information. And this is the standard halo model. This is the S1 stream uh, distribution plus some error uh, around that. Now these errors are, are huge, but the normalization here is actually also really small. So we see that this, this is, is a stream is actually four peak zone. So the peak is about uh, 300 kilometers per second where the uh, standard halo model is roughly 220 kilometers per second. Um, so what we did here, then we used the Skya derived stream um, for the S1, uh, the Skya derived distribution from the S1 stream um, to calculate the recoil rates, as I, how I mentioned before. And we use these recoil rates to fit the Dharma uh, data both in the energy direction and in the time uh, space. So fitting all these, uh, and we fit the other direct detection experiments in the same way. So always remember, remember that the DAMA measures uh, uh, in particular annual modulation, while the other experiments measure, measure null results. They don't, they don't do an annual modulation. So the, what they're saying is that we try and we just sit there and we look for some uh, signal of dark matter. If we don't see it, then we, we exclude that region. Whereas Dharma actually is looking for an annual uh, signal of, of, of this, uh, or this modulation of dark matter. And so what we have here is this in this, in this Gaia direct distribution. So F here is the isospin vector, which tells me how um, dark matter interacts with the, both nucleus, nucleons and um, neut protons and neutrons at the same time. So if F is one, then it interacts with protons and neutrons at the same time. So it's isospin, uh, it's not isospin violating, if F is different from one, then it's ISIS been uh, violating. So here we see the gray is the standard halo model 
and the, 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 the different colors, uh, the, including the S1 stream, uh, sorry, the Gaia derived distribution. So this is the sub halo plus the so substructure plus halo, uh, sub halo components. And here you see that this banana shape here is using Dharma's annual modulation, so time information. This orange blob is using the energy uh, information. So this is kind of expected that we see that the, the, this energy information kind of rescinds a little bit or goes forward in mass. This is because the, the um, remember that the, as the stream, the, the peak of this stream is actually lower in uh, velocity than the standard halo model. And so the, the minimum velocity required to, to, uh, to cause a nuclear recoil actually pushes the mass up uh, a little bit. Now, if we go to the, to the stellar stream, this uh, S1 stream, and we assume, we don't know, first of all, we don't know what the density of the stream is. So let's assume first that it's 25%. Uh, the density of the stream uh, is 25% of the total dark matter in our, in our halo. And if we plot these again, again, we see a change, a, a small change in the, uh, uh, a small shift towards the low energy. Uh, now, if the, once we increase the, the, the velocity distribution, that means that the minimum velocity that I require to, uh, to for cause a nuclear recoil actually shifts my mass uh, down uh, a little bit. Or shifts my limits down to lower, to, to lower masses. But, not actually by quite a, quite a lot, uh, because now I'm moving, I'm shifting the stream, uh, the peak of the stream from, from, or the peak of my velocity distribution from 220 kilometers per second to about 300 kilometers per second. Now let's do something drastic and it's assume that it's 100% of the total uh, stream, of the total uh, density, which we know cannot really be true, right? And so we see again, like there's a big, there's another shift a smaller shift in the uh, smallish shift in the uh, in these from the standard halo model, uh, but not actually enough. So what we would expect if Dharma was actually explained by this S1 screen, that we would expect this yellow uh, blob, the yellow banana shape, and this orange blob to actually move here relative to these blue, red, and black uh, lines. Now what we see is actually not that. So unfortunately, this is a negative. Uh, result, meaning that we don't actually, this actually does not explain, uh, cannot explain Dharma, but we learned something interesting from this. We learned that um, we can, we've learned a lot about, uh, we can learn a lot about Gaia from, uh, um, and how to infer the velocity distributions of dark matter, um, assuming that we already understand, we understand the stellar uh, um, or the distributions of old uh, metal poor stars very well. We need to understand also the, the uh, uh, densities of these, these stellar streams, if they do actually trace their dark matter, uh, uh, the dark matter halo. Um, we, we understand also, like, so, so from um, before Gaia was, uh, before we had Gaia, where people talked about stellar streams, there were, there were basically mathematical models put in place about what a stream would look like. Now we actually have data of what a stream looks like. And we put that data into our, our um, recall distributions. And we see that, again, this doesn't uh, actually uh, really work. So there's, there's a lot that we have learned from this, uh, meaning being that one of the being that this, this stellar stream does not, doesn't really uh, explain the Dharma <laughs> signal. And this Dharma signal should be coming from something else, or most likely you know, some background that they also don't understand. But yeah, that's it. Thanks.